Herzlich willkommen bei der Folge 31 unseres Café Steelpoint. Wir sehen, dass die Zuschauerzahlen der Leute, die gleich zuschauen, die live mit uns dabei sind, dass die abnehmen. Viele von euch sind, schon, sind noch in der Praxis und arbeiten noch. Die anderen sind in anderen Kaffeehäusern, die seit einigen Tagen wieder offen haben. Aber wir freuen uns, dass ihr dabei seid und wir freuen uns über alle, die sich später unsere Programme anschauen. Für heute gilt wie bei allen letzten Sendungen, wenn ihr Fragen habt während des Vortrages, wenn ihr Fragen habt während der Diskussion, stellt diese Fragen. Wir werden sie gerne beantworten. Und äh, ihr könnt die Fragen äh, ruhig in, allen, in, in vier verschiedenen Sprachen stellen. Unser heutiger Gast, Raphael Segarra Parodi, spricht Spanisch, Französisch, Deutsch und Englisch. Das heißt, whatever you like, uh, he will be able to understand your question. Uh, Raphael uh, und ich, wir kennen uns schon relativ lange von internationalen Kongressen, von internationalen Konferenzen. Er hat sehr lang äh, bei der CESO in Paris gearbeitet und war dort für Forschung zuständig. Und CESO ist eine der Schulen, die in OSEAN Mitglied waren, in unserem europäischen Dachverband äh, von Osteopathie-Schulen. Äh, von daher kenne ich Raphael als jemanden, der sich mit Forschung beschäftigt, der sehr logisch, sehr analytisch ist. Äh, und ich, vorige Woche habe ich dann erfahren, dass es auch eine andere Seite von ihm gibt, dass er sich in den letzten Jahren auch mit der Geschichte der Osteopathie, auch mit Philosophie, auch mit Spiritualität beschäftigt hat und dass das so seine zweite Seite ist, die er da gerade entwickelt und mit der er sich beschäftigt und äh, dass das ein ganz wichtiges Thema ist. Er hat im Forschungsbereich nicht nur an der CESO gearbeitet, sondern war auch in, in Kirksville ein Jahr und hat dort am Andrew Taylor Steel Institut geforscht. Er hat mitgearbeitet an um, University College for Osteopathy, an der früheren British School of Osteopathy in London und ist jetzt aktives Mitglied von der CAM Collaboration von Francesco Ceritellis Forschungsverband, der unglaublich produktiv ist darin, äh, aus dem Bereich der Neurowissenschaften und aus anderen Bereichen der Osteopathie Studien zu publizieren. Im ersten Teil hat Raphael uns über die Geschichte erzählt, über Einflüsse der amerikanischen Ureinwohner auf Andrew Taylor Still, auf seine Philosophie, auf die Idee von Body, Mind, Spirit, die möglicherweise von den Indianern kam. Und heute werden wir uns noch genauer anschauen, wie diese Ideen, wie diese Philosophie unsere osteopathische Praxis beeinflusst und was die moderne Neurowissenschaft inzwischen darüber weiß, wie diese Dinge funktionieren und was man da schon alles belegen kann davon. Welcome, Raphael. Nice to have you back at the Café Steel Point. Vielen Dank, Raymond. Thank you for this nice introduction and this nice summary of what we've discussed last week. Have you, after last week, have you had any feedback for, from, from people? Have you, have you, have you got, gotten any, any questions? Um, not so much because, uh, well, at, at least the people who knows me, they, mm -hmm. they, can, they can understand more uh, the, all the, the, the framework of, about what we are, uh, we are building and how um, we, can, we can bridge um, modern uh, scientific mm -hmm. analytical views of medicine and combine this with all Uh, the, the traditional medicine and this intuitive part because in osteopathy with there's all, there's nothing really new what's new is the the scientific framework allowing people to discuss about all those things uh, in explicit ways that's the only new thing so that's there's nothing really new about about um, the, the the content it's much more about how we can describe this Uh, with appropriate scientific vocabulary so uh, we can reach much more people and more patients. I've, I've, I've been passionate about consciousness research also for, uh, already for, for, for many years. And I, I, always, I always thought it was a false dichotomy, dichotomy uh, the, a false uh, contrast between spiritual experience and science. And a lot of people claim that you cannot do research on, on psychological events and spiritual events on states of consciousness. And that's just not true. And there really is a lot of research out there. 
It's just that uh, reading your uh, your articles and seeing what has been published, I, I realize I'm not up to date at all in the debate, and a lot has been going on in the last two or three years, which I which I missed out on. So I'm I'm curious to hear more uh, about that. Yeah, you're right. This this is something relatively new. What I can recommend, if people are interested, is to have a look at the Professor Anil Set uh, website. He's the director of the, um, the Sackett Science, uh, Science of, um, Research Center of Consciousness at the University of Brighton, mm -hmm. and he's conducting this type of, of study. Uh, you will be surprised about how the ethical committees can accept in, in the UK, so in Europe, uh, to, to study these uh, induced states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if you can um, induce those physiological states, if you can... Uh, measure uh, what's going on at, at the brain connectivity levels and if you can collect data from patients from subjects uh, what they can describe we can this, we can put little science to describe this and and then we can convert this into new models to improve patient care so I've contacted him and he's not aware about any studies related to manual therapy so this is absolutely new so, uh, like you said, it's um, it's it's all traditions that have already always been here. We now have the science to study this. So, nothing really new. Like to answer your, your question, the new thing is the that we can we are creating uh, frameworks that can that can uh, allow patients to and and practitioners to to use them in the Western world. Mm -hmm. I think you've prepared a few slides again. Uh, yeah. Should should we switch over to 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 the slides and see what uh, what you've prepared? Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So you can see all my screen. So so let's start. So like like Raymond just said uh, last week, we were more on the philosophical part about the, um, the traditional medicine uh, heritage that we can find in finding osteopathic principle. Now we'll have a look more on the practical side. Uh, all those uh, influences that, that, that can be tracked back to the period of 80 still um, uh, among the Shoni when, you, when he spent two years of his life with his family at the Wakaruza mission. So today we're gonna we're gonna divide the the, the the presentation into three parts. First, on the therapeutic alliance, osteopathic diagnosis, and osteopathic techniques. So just as um, Raymond asked me, um, we now have a neuroscience model to describe the spiritual experiences. I've put spirituals into quotes because. Um, in the Western world, and as a practitioner, we don't have to discuss that in, within the, the consultation. This, this is too private. However, what we can do is, the spirit, is to describe the spiritual dimension and how those, those, to convert those beliefs into physiological processes that can inform our practice. So I, I'd, I'd like to make a clear distinction between spirituality and spiritual dimension in healthcare. So we'll see the two main um, um, processes that are uh, involved. And finally, um, uh, as you said, Raymond, uh, we may have some questions from, uh, from people directly on YouTube because the purpose is to give information and allowing practitioners to reflect on themselves, on what type of practice, practice they can uh, provide to their patients, ranging from the body-mind paradigm, typical from the Western medicine, to more body-mind-spirit uh, paradigm that is more related to traditional medicine. Again, there's no, uh, it's not a comparison. Not, there's no one that is better than the, another. We just need to, um, to, 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 to respond to patients' uh, request. Okay, if a patient's request is here, so we need to adjust. And some patients 
need more than just fixing their bones. They want to give more uh, different approach. So we have to be flexible in us. And what we're going to discuss today is to provide a, fra a framework um, to uh, allow patient, practi practitioners to, to address specific uh, patients' needs. So as uh, we've seen uh, last week, osteopathic principles are evolving. And in the last that were published in, 2000, in 2002, there's a specific uh, print tenet of osteopathic medicine talking about a dynamic interaction between body, mind, and spirit. So that is the topic of today. And as we've discussed, and you can get the references uh, he, right here, this body-mind-spirit paradigm is uh, inherited from um, a, key, a key native uh, American elite principles, body-mind-spirit-emotion, that is uh, represented by the, the, their traditional medicine wheel. So first, let's talk about the therapeutic alliance, which is the interaction between patients and practitioners. So this um, this is... This graph was very important uh, for me uh, because when I was a student and when I was uh, when I started to teach, I was only focused on the specific effect of manual therapy. I've never realized that the contextual effects might increase or decrease the the outcome of this specific effect of of therapy. So this paper is published by two um, Italian uh, physiotherapists, Testa and Rossettini, and they are, they, I, I I really recommend uh, reading their their paper and on how to uh, uh, increase placebo and decrease nocebo. So, well, obviously. As a manual uh, therapist, we are focused on the skills. We, we try to develop our skills related to treatment, to manipulation, but we forget or we don't pay, to me, enough attention to all the surroundings, all these non-specific effects, and all those contextual factors. So obviously, so the, the healthcare setting might influence the outcome of a specific manual technique, clinicians and patient characteristics uh, uh, as well. But today, we're going to focus on the relationship, the, the relationship between the patient and the practitioner. So the, that's the therapeutic alliance. So that's our very first paper that, were, that was published last year with Francesco from Com and, and Jerry uh, from uh, the UCL in, in London. So what we've tried is to uh, describe, include this, um, this dimension, this spiritual dimension into the Western um, clinical scenario by introducing in, in this, this biopsychosocial approach. So it's, it's like refining an existing model, a more holistic model that is not only focused on uh, reducing pain and increasing movement with a manual uh, treatment. So uh, there's a lot of definitions of, uh, of spirituality and, and religion. So, so basically, it's the, the common things, the, the two common features of all those um, definitions are first, uh, the connection to something that is greater than ourselves. And second is um, the, the, the giving sense, giving meaning, giving a purpose of our experience, of, of our life. So there's a lot of um, activities that we can recognize here that, 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 for example, mindfulness meditation, gardening may be considered as a, as a spiritual activity. And obviously religion, it's easier to understand. And you have in between uh, some activities that can, be that can be related to one, uh, uh, one uh, to the other uh, dimension. So as you can see, uh, spirituality in healthcare is increasing. The number of publications is increasing, so it raises interest. It was developed, developed first for uh, end-of-life uh, patients for uh, terminal uh, illnesses, but it's now uh, the um, other professions are developing, like nurses, developing uh, a framework to include those, uh, this dimension into uh, into um, routine healthcare. 
why? why? What is the rationale behind this? So that's the theoretical model of, of how religions may affect physical health. So, like I said, um, yeah, here to the left, religion or spirituality, this is something unique to each person, to each individual. And to me, this has nothing to do, uh, this, this should not be discussed uh, within uh, the therapeutic lines. However, we can ask a couple of questions or, or if patients seem, if they want to give a meaning to what they are experiencing, uh, their pain, musculoskeletal pain, it may be interesting to uh, to address those, to, to evaluate what their belief system is. So, um, religion and spirituality may affect mental health, social support and health behaviors that can be directly uh, or indirectly related to a couple of functions that we can, that we as osteopaths are used to, are used to deal with. Uh, influences of the autonomic nervous system, um, different risk behaviors. So this may be um, interesting to evaluate. So the very first uh, person who introduced this uh, spiritual dimension into osteopathic care was uh, Deborah Smith, in a paper that was published two years ago. And she was the first to describe a biopsychosocial spiritual model in osteopathy. So the, the, and here she described the, the spiritual side, not, not for um, in routine care, but for the people who want to give meaning and purpose. And if the practitioner think this may uh, affect the, the outcome. So what we've done is simply uh, moving further uh, into, okay, uh, this spiritual dimension may be useful, but how can we um, use that in, the, in our daily in our daily practice? So here we have proposed this body, mind, spirit, uh, again, uh, figure and describe the spiritual uh, dimensions uh, into potential, uh, into prognosis, potential prognosis factor of the evolution. Uh, just an example, uh, depending on different tradition, pain experience can be uh, interpreted uh, differently. Um, some patients might uh, see, interpret pain as a punishment and other might interpret pain as a way for to, 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 as, a, as, a, as a way to develop coping strategy and to develop and to make positive experience of pain. So obviously, even if you're, we're going to make manual treatment manipulation, we, we, it, it might be interesting to uh, understand what's the, the purpose of the, of the pain on how patients specifically uh, interpret uh, pain. So um, we've tried to, that's, that's our typical um, way of, 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 of thinking. First uh, is to get a peer reviewing process, to go through a peer reviewing process by, uh, with uh, publication in scientific peer review journal. And then we've tried to get some feedback uh, at different congresses. So this one is the, the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. So I, I went back to Missouri last year, last, last October in St. Louis. And um, uh, this is the main association uh, evaluating um, in the, the role of uh, religion and spirituality, not only in healthcare, but more in the social aspect. And that was the first time that they had a manual therapist um, uh, selected for uh, a presentation. So that that's that was the content of our first uh, paper. So we try to make connections with people and um, we are have tried uh, to to provide this type of information uh, in more accessible accessible ways for uh, clinicians by promoting our CPD. And uh, sadly, Raymond, I was supposed to present that at the OSEAN Congress. We were selected, but you will have to wait one more year because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Yes, uh, we had to cancel it, unfortunately. 
So I hope you will be able to uh, wait for one more year um, for, to attend our workshop. The SPD is an acronym for the spiritual dimension and how we can use that to um, implement the biopsychosocial model into osteopathic practice. Then, um, what about the osteopathic uh, diagnosis? So this paper uh, really blew my mind, uh, not only because it was, uh, of, probably because, I don't know, it's uh, my conflict of interest because Francesco uh, was the is the first author of this of this paper is it's the it's the the, the, the topic of his uh, PhD in neuroscience and uh, so my apologies Francesco because he has spent so many years on that and I'm going to talk about his paper in just 30 seconds and I can barely grade probably 20 percent of the content but what is really really fascinating is that uh, in his study, he, he had 40 subjects uh, lying down on uh, fMRI, two groups of 20 uh, subjects, and osteopaths were applying a constant light touch on the, on, on the lower limb. So the specific effect of the technique was exactly the same. And Francesco, on, on one group, on 20, he asked 20 osteopaths to, um, to concentrate on what we are using, what we're doing uh, as osteopaths, just thinking about the anatomy and how, how we can improve things uh, through palpation. It was an active cognitive task on the, focused on palpation. On the other group, uh, the osteopaths had headphones and they were um, they need to be so they were still palpating, but they were, they were distracted by different sounds. And the thing is that the the patients for the patients was exactly the same. They couldn't they were blinded uh, to know if the the, the so osteopaths were uh, focused on the sound or on what they were doing during palpations. And the, they at the F functional uh, MRI they have seen a significant changes in the group where osteopaths were focused on what they were doing uh, during, uh, during palpations. So this is the typical example of the relevance of science. Um, because I'm sure Raymond and I, I, I've, I've learned this um, since the first day of when I was a student in osteopathy, okay? You ask people you ask uh, the osteopath to be focused on what he's doing and not being distracted. But for the first time, Francesco uh, and his team were able to extract this type of data. And what was an intuitive approach, an empirical approach, is now a fact. So if we can describe this, um, we can improve. Okay, so we can use here. So this is the relevance of, of science. Uh, then in the Western world, you know, the spiritual dimension uh, has been uh, dealt with two sides. One side is uh, the, the, the scientific part and the other is the philosophy, the philosophic part. So one of my best uh, favorite philosopher is Jean-Claude Van Damme. And is you can see one of these famous quotes, uh, quote. so you need at least six or seven years to understand the philosophy and concentration of karate, to clean your spirit of everything and dedicate your mind and body to the sport. So this may understand the question we had uh, um, last week about, uh, would you recommend any, any type of initiation for osteopaths? My answer is no, you remember. But... If we have a look at Jean-Claude Van Damme, when he's talking about karate, you can use karate in different ways. You can start to break uh, bricks or you can use it in a more um, spiritual way. So that's this type of, uh, of uh, interaction. So um, that's the, our, our paper, uh, again, that we wrote with Francesco, Jerry and Jason, and that was... Uh, approved by um, 
a traditional healer from the Shawnee and from the Lakota tribes who gave us a kind of permission to um, talk about their tradition. And this is uh, the table that we've, we've, we've discussed uh, the upper part of the table uh, last week. And now we can uh, uh, more relate it to the, the principle. Now we can have a look at the practical side, what about the, the manual therapy. So, um, in our way to understand manual technique, in the body-mind framework, which is typical from the modern Western allopathic medicine, the purpose is to improve range of motion and decrease pain, and patients are treated in the ordinary reality. I'll give you a definition right after. Whether in traditional Native American and shamanic healing practices, uh, you, there's a use uh, of manual techniques, but, but within a body, mind, spirit, emotion framework to improve overall well-being, and patients are treated in the non-ordinary reality. So I can give you my definition of shamanic healing treatment because I know uh, that in the Western world it can scares it scares people. It's nothing more than um, um, uh, a, a temporary change in brain connectivity for healing purpose. All the traditions throughout the world, they have different uh, rituals, but the outcome is always the same. Patients are moved from the ordinary to the non-ordinary reality. Uh, healing occurs and then they return to the, to the ordinary reality. In osteopathy, there was one question last week, we always treat patients in the ordinary reality. And the purpose is in between. So we can improve range of motion and decrease pain, but we give more a psychosocial uh, approach. And we have just seen that we can even include the spiritual dimensions. So now we're going to discuss about the, the channel for therapeutic information. That's another uh, very, very fascinating um, hypothesis to, to describe the, this, those two different channels. So basically, our fresh scan Luna, there are research from the Prague University in the Czech uh, Republic. The first is what we more related to the Western world, the perceptual cognitive symbolics performed in the ordinary reality. So sensory perception, cognitive processing, then we compare with uh, known things, and then we give uh, a, a feedback, okay? Uh, the direct intuitive non-local is more related to um, the, the, the therapeutic information that is occurring uh, during shamanic healing treatment or uh, traditional medicine. And this is a direct experience with no subject-object splits. And I'm sure when I'm talking about this, each osteopath looking at this say, oh, this type of technique I can that I use with my patient, I can certainly put that classify within this framework and others like such as for, that, that would be for example the high velocity thrust uh, soft tissues techniques maybe more on this related to this type of, uh, of uh, perceptions uh, on the cranial techniques visceral technique myofascial technique those techniques that are um, using light touch may probably uh, uh, more likely related to this type of, uh, of, uh, of perceptions. So um, but, but getting back to, the, to this table, so the channel for therapeutic information in the Western allopathic medicine, it's more the perceptual symbolic uh, channel only. And in the, the traditional Native American shamanic uh, healing practices, it's the more the direct intuitive non-local um, a ch channel for therapeutic information only. And what we have proposed is that in osteopathy we may use those different type of um, um, the, those two way of, uh, of therapeutic information. Another thing that I'd like to to to, to point out 
um, altered state of consciousness may be scary again because there's for people that are not familiar with this or that that are scared by healing traditional healers um, there's a systematic review that was published uh, last year Raffone uh, colleagues from um, colleagues of Francesco uh, from the Sapienza Università in Roma and they described the meditative the meditative brain and they've described a meditative state by um, it's less than 1% of concomitant activation of the neurons of the cortex. Again, um, if we can use uh, scientific words to, or scientific concept to describe this, at least for me, it's less scary because if we can see this, if we can describe this, there's no more magic. There's no more fluffy theory. It becomes science, okay? And what is really fascinating is that people that we call uneducated, and I, I put into quotes because they are not, they, they have not received the same education as we have received in, in Europe or in the Western world. They are teaching by uh, ancient, by experienced uh, people. So in this, in this, uh, they have learned the same thing just by observation. This is really fascinating. So how can we make sense of these two different approaches? Again, the kinefin model, the use of the kinefin model within uh, osteopathic practice that was proposed last year by uh, Christian and Francesca. Um, we can see on the right side the more analytical system using a hypothetical deductive reasoning for manual um, osteopathic diagnosis. And on the left side, it's more the intuitive system with pattern recognition. And this is more related to what traditional healers have always done. And here you can, we can have a look at the operator patient proximity they are talking about interoceptive approach. So to me, when I read this paper, it was it, all what I've, what I've seen that I've just discussed a couple of, a few minutes ago, all made sense, at least for me, and hopefully for you. So what is a pattern recognition? Um, was, was kannst du sehen, Raymond? Vielleicht nur weiße und uh, schwarze yeah. Yeah. So this is oh, I've 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 talked about um, Professor Anil said I've borrowed uh, his image from one of his presentation. This is just to explain how the brain is working. He, he receives information, new information. Then we give additional information. Now we can see uh, I'm firm. Und ein Mädchen. So, and if, so I, I'm giving you, uh, the, the brain receive new information, so the, a horse and a young lady. And then if we have a look back at the same, the exact same picture that we've seen initially that we, it was impossible to understand what is happening, I'm sure we can all recognize, we can still see the horse and, and the lady. So this is the other way the, the, this is the brain predictive uh, model um, that, that is describing to as a learning process for our brain. So that's the, the Bayesian brain. Um, this review is, that was published three years ago is quite uh, intense, but it worthwhile to understand uh, how, the, how, the, how the, the, our brain works. So the example I've, 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 I've used for the visual information, new visual information, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the same thing with manual perception. Okay, so we construct our experience based on previous uh, situation. Uh, this allows us to anticipate the experience, and when a new information comes, we have an expectation violated, and we are creating experience. So this is a, 
circular process, the way uh, our brain is learning. So, um, and this is typical of the of the of the the, the, the training of traditional healers. Like I've said last week, there's no school to become traditional healers or become shaman. They learn by experience, by treating patients. Um, well, I'm more familiar with the sheep people in the rainforest. They they are talked with uh, different plants. So plants, again, like I said, they are opening and closing different um, uh, circuits, neuronal circuits, and they have access to different types of perception, a temporary change in brain connectivity, and then they return to the to the normal state. But once, have you, have, have you, uh, as you have just realized with the, the horse and the lady, once the brain has perceived this, it can easily recognize, okay? So this is really, this, this pattern recognition is very typical of uh, the, the traditional healing uh, tradition. And let's see if we can make sense of that in osteopathic diagnosis. So as I've, I've already talked about this, uh, this neuroscience model this, 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 uh, with a clear distinction between ordinary and non-ordinary uh, state of consciousness. Um, obviously, it's not that simple. There's, there's a lot of theories and ranging for, for example, sleeping is an altered state of consciousness. Okay, we all sleep. So you, we don't have to be uh, scared about this type of vocabulary. I prefer to use with my patients, with my colleagues, I prefer to use the terminology of meditative uh, brain, okay? Reducing the activity. And if you reduce the activity, you become more aware of uh, the, the informations that are already there. There's nothing, um, really uh, new that is arising. We're just becoming more conscious on different perceptions. And here is the, 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 the bodily self-consciousness. Uh, again, that's, uh, it's all related to uh, another paper. Uh, Francesco is a co-author, but the first author is Gian Domenico D'Alessandro, and they've published um, a paper where, they're, um, where they, they've put the hypothesis of a more an interoceptive um, approach of diagnosis rather than the proprioceptive approach. So basically, proprioception, as we can see, is the experience of where I am in space, is, is movement. You know, it's easy, it's, it's mobility test. Do I have more rotation to the right than to the left? Okay, it's more the analytical part the scientific Western uh, way of uh, dealing with musculoskeletal trouble. Uh, exteroception is the experience for where, from where I perceive the world, and interoception has been defined as a self-identification with the body, the experience of owning a body. So this um, integration of multisensory bodily signals has raised an interest in osteopathic research. So the connection I've made is uh, related to the topic of today, which is the body, mind, spirit. How can we use this uh, body, mind, spirit paradigm in our daily practice as an osteopath? It's again, another theory. Michael van Elk is a, is a PhD from the University of Amsterdam, and he has developed a theory exactly like a, in, in, with, with the same multisensory process between exteroception, proprioception, and interoception, and he has related them with spiritual experiences. So again, I've put spiritual experiences because this is the only way that we have to describe this before. But no, we have science, we have, we have neuroscience models, and we could certainly discuss that in more physiological way. If we can discuss that in physiological way, we can bring that into the, the practice with our patient. That's our uh, belief. 
And mystical experiences may emerge because of three different um, reasons or hypotheses. A differential weighting of interoceptive compared to exteroceptive signals, changes in interoceptive or exteroceptive error monitoring process. This is something really um, important because most of the time, um, patients, they are very re reluctant to talk about this type of experience. Uh, if you know, for people who have a, who experience, who have a health attack, almost 30% uh, have a near-death experience, okay? They will certainly uh, don't never talk about what they have experienced uh, even to their spouse, even to close friends, okay? And so this may be interesting to deal with this type of issue into the osteopathic practice because the musculoskeletal, the way we will touch musculoskeletal uh, e evaluate is may be prob probably linked to this type of, of belief. So, so basically, um, it's, it, this, this paper is really fascinating because it, it, there's a physiological uh, hypothesis that may explain uh, hallucination, okay? Again, during a, a nerdist experience, there's a, there's a, um, a decrease in blood flow perfusion, mainly through the, the, the default mode network, and this part of the, this network within the brain is where the autobiographic memory is stored. So basically, if you have a look at the, 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 the this type of, of papers, uh, it said, oh, I've seen my life in, my whole life in just one minute. Not exactly. They have seen first the most traumatic event of their life. It's all, it's when they, when, if you read papers describing, aiming at describing what patients have, have experienced, they say, it's uh, traumatic, so it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, cancer, and loss, grief. So the most traumatic experiences. And interesting, interestingly, uh, in uh, with different uh, molecules that are, they can induce the same experiences. For example, with the DMT, the dimethyltryptamine which is the active component of the ayahuasca, the, which is in, used in, only in, in the Peruvian uh, rainforest, not in, not, in, in the Western, not in the Western world. Um, in, in Brazil, they have published papers and they give ayahuasca and, the, and this, they describe exactly the same type of experience, the most traumatic experience. And when they put uh, people into uh, fMRI, they have seen a decrease in the brain connectivity, especially in the default mode network. Again, uh, so if Francesco is, is looking, ciao Francesco, I know I'm not a neuroscientist and I can certainly not compare this type of data. I have not enough knowledge to understand the, the, this, the function of the default mode network, but I can set, I, 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 there's a f lot of things that can be studied. And this is very interesting because if there's a differential weighting into uh, interoceptive and uh, exteroceptive pathway, and if we have another theory here uh, for, um, uh, that is more addressed to the interoceptive side of, of the touch, maybe this could explain something, a couple of things that we have um, seen, all scenes in our, in our practice. We're, I'm sure all osteopaths have, have seen patients start to cry, start to scream, start to experience. Um, so this may be related to the, same, uh, to the same pattern. So obviously much more research is needed, but there's a way, and as I've, as I've said, even the the, the gurus of the consciousness uh, are not aware of any study uh, for um, evaluating the manual, the manual aspects of uh, altered states of consciousness. So 
Changes in multisensory integration results in altered self-referential processing and during traditional and shamanic healing practices. And this is really fascinating because um, the traditional healers um, and probably uh, those that Andrew Taylor still uh, have, has met when he was living among them, just by up observing nature, observing the way the body function, uh, they, they, they were able to put people into a modified state of consciousness. Now, with science, we can explain what is, what is, uh, what is, what is going on. So, uh, if you ask a neuroscientist who knows absolutely nothing about those uh, healing uh, shamanic tradition, and you ask him, what would you do to induce uh, an altered state of consciousness in the people? Oh, he would certainly respond, you cut, you cut these people from this um, usual environment. Okay, so, and as healing practices, healing rituals, you have uh, isolation. Your people are in the dark, for example, all the ceremonies are held uh, at night. Uh, and then you, you, will, you, you will certainly um, uh, answer, you, you can put this type of people into high physiological stress with uh, fasting, with pain, with different type of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of plants. So uh, obviously, this is uh, what we have called the, the revolution. Okay, it's like the, the hearse going back to the starting point. Okay, each year, a revolution lasts one year. So this, the, the type of, of treatment that Andrew Taylor still have, has experienced uh, when he was among the native, now we have the science to explain that. And obviously, uh, we are here in the Western world. We are treating patients in ordinary a state of consciousness, but we need to be aware uh, of all these uh, traditions. From we need to understand exactly where all those type of techniques comes from. They are all rooted. Uh, when we when when I'm talking about it, this interoceptive approach is the cranial techniques, visceral techniques, myofascial techniques. So light touch, light contact, without any movement and with um, less activity, with the, the practitioner uh, focusing on what he's doing. Um, in Francesco's study, study and, and he was able to see differences only after 15 minutes. Okay, so the osteopath had to stay 15 minutes uh, focusing on uh, what is ex his palpatory experience. So uh, what we have, what we tried to do uh, was to um, give osteopaths this type of experience, um, uh, inducing a meditative state. We're using that with uh, music, and we're using that with uh, this same historical approach. Since Andrew Taylor still was familiar with Native American tradition. We, we've asked, um, I have I've asked my friends, brothers, call them whatever, if they would be okay to come over for a CPD and to play music, to induce meditative state, and then osteopaths, they can modify, there's a temporary uh, changes in brain connectivity, okay? They can see the the horse and the young lady, and then they return to their uh, normal state. And when they, each time they can see a, a horse and a young lady, that, that's an example for the visual input, but that's exactly the same for the, for the, for the manual input they can recognize. So uh, the, the board of trustee of foundation were, was kind enough to let me try this uh, during the last uh, congress in Sicily, so, uh, we found a, a funky acronym for this uh, for this workshop. So, new approach for touch interpretation, valuing and emphasizing an interoception for osteopathic diagnosis after meditative states comes native in Ostman. Uh, 
So what we've done, um, if we were asking uh, people to focus on their therapeutic attitude. Okay, we were, I, I, I've put a, um, a soundtrack of meditative music. So that was native uh, American uh, songs. And then we used a questionnaire and um, they, they were using a question online questionnaire on their um, on their smartphone and they were able to see um, if there were any changes in the perceptions and the the, palpa the, the palpation and well it was a workshop and it lasted only one hour and a half and it was surprising that even that with 10 music minutes of music in the dark with using that a couple of osteopaths have experiences, experienced um, time and space distortion, seeing lights, seeing colors, seeing events from the past. So again, this is nothing new. The only new thing is that we give a scientific framework to describe this and to allow people to explore uh, what uh, can what they can perceive during during palpation. So what about the key native? Uh, what about the osteopathic techniques? So uh, it's still a work in progress. I'd like to introduce my wonderful BMS team. So with Raphael, Alexi, and Guillaume. So we are working uh, on that. So it's always the same process the peer reviewing process, because it's easy to get lost uh, when, 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 you, when you work on those, on those sites. So you want a peer review uh, process first for the papers, then for the, for the, um, for the Congress, and then we can uh, propose that to uh, practitioners. So what are the take on messages? So obviously we've seen an historical and cultural Native American heritage in osteopathic practices and, and, and principles. Again, uh, it, it may be interesting, but patients, when they come, I mean, my, my, in my practice, what they, when they come, they are in pain. They, they don't care about what still did, said, and the others. It's very important for us to know where we come from and where we are going from now. Um, this is, uh, again, that's, that's the editorial of the last, uh, that was published in the last IJOM, and George Esteves is the first author. And uh, it, it was a critical uh, evaluation of the different models and theoretical frameworks for osteopathic care. And our question, or at least my question, is, what is the relevance of neuroscience? What are the relevance of neuroscience models for holistic approaches in, MS, in musculoskeletal care? So we, we have seen that we have neuroscience model that can easily be used to uh, apply body, mind, spirit paradigm for the therapeutic alliance by including this spiritual dimension into the biopsychosocial model and in osteopathic diagnosis, and hopefully I'll give you uh, more information in the future for osteopathic treatment, especially for the interoceptive uh, approach of osteopathic, um, of osteopathic techniques, which is a static light touch that can be used for cranial, for visceral, for myofascial techniques. Okay, so that, that, that was a critical thinking, or at least, um, there are models, obviously, that are that aim to describe this type of experience. But since there was no there was no science, it was only the only thing that, that was available was kind of poetic uh, theory of something that may be very useful for practitioners, but at, that is not that is really problematic if you want to talk about this. Uh, if you want to go uh, into the academic world and talk about this, it's easier to use uh, this type of neuroscience models. So again, that's um, all of, of this presentation. 
from the last week and from this one from, from today is, was to raise attention about the existing model that can be used to describe this body-mind spirit, this holistic approach of osteopathy. But not every practitioner may be interested. Again, 20 years ago, we really interested in those aspects. But patients, they can, they can be, they can be um, looking for this type of treatment, you know, just improving overall well-being and it might be uh, strange to claim that osteopaths are holistic practitioners and they are mainly doing, uh, uh, avoiding these spiritual aspects that can inform, not in routine care, but for some patients, for some clinical condition that can certainly inform the, the therapeutic alliance. So if you want, if you, it's a, it's a call for work. Uh, if people are interested in joining us to, to move all this, further, you are more than welcome. Um, uh, the nonprofit foundation come collaboration. Uh, we are creating this embodies department. Like, uh, uh, Francesco is, uh, is the best for finding, uh, funky acronym as well. So emotion, mind, body, and spirit uh, department. So just send me an email or contact, uh, contact Francesco. There's a lot of things to do. And uh, we, we're trying first to establish a um, framework. I'd like to thank, um, again, my, my colleagues from the ATC Reserve Institute because I was there uh, eight years ago, just in the hard science, uh, focusing on physiological parts, and now uh, later on, uh, more focusing on this uh, spiritual side of the, the body-mind-spirit paradigm. The Museum of Osteopathic Medicine for providing us, and allowing us to use all the materials related to the period of uh, AT steel. Uh, among the, the Shawnee. The Nonprofit Foundation from Collaboration for, um, yes, for the patients they had throughout the past years because today I can present you something clean but, and hopefully clean uh, with strict boundaries between what is personal, what is not personal, what can be discussed within uh, uh, the, the therapeutic encounter. So they really helped me a lot to, to, to have a, a clear message. And uh, I'd like uh, to thank, obviously, all my team, again, for their patience um, and for um, helping me to, uh, to, to, to propose this type of uh, information for, for, for practitioners. So I thank you again for the invitation, for this double uh, invitation, Raymond and Manuel and uh, uh, the people at the Wiener Schule für Osteopathie in uh, Vienna. And uh, if some people have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to, to answer. Thank you for another exciting presentation, Raphael. Really, really a great uh, amount of material and, and gr great quality that, of, of things that you gather together to to start to form a picture of that of that area that often is hard to grasp and hard to understand. Let's see if there are questions from the audience. If not, I've got a long list here <laughs> I, of, of, of remarks and questions. It was really hard not to not to uh, interrupt you already after the second or third slide. Yeah. But let's see if, if people uh, want to, no, nothing so far. The first thing that it, it, it's more an observation. You were uh, in, in at the beginning of your presentation, you were quite quick to uh, say, to talk about religion and spirituality as more or less the same thing. You started out with spirituality and then you talked about research that was more about religion. Where would you think are the differences? Is that really, is, is that a simplification 
or is it the same thing? Thank you very much for this for this question, and because this is very important. And sorry if I went quickly mm -hmm. about about this. Uh, obviously, this is not the same. But um, since this 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 talk today was was focused on osteopathic practices, I'm here in my uh, in my room, mm -hmm. so I never talk about spirituality or religion. Mm -hmm. I can discuss with patients the influence of their own specific belief that can have on their health. That's all. Mm -hmm. So, in, in that sense, the at least to me, the, the physiological component of those beliefs is the same. Maybe I'm wrong, but I consider them the same. You believe in, in one God of multiple gods or in the spirits of the nature or whatever, it's a belief, it's a belief system. And is implied, um, um, it has influences on mental health, on uh, risk behaviors, on adherence of, of treatments, something that is, that is described. So uh, I'm an osteopath, so I need only to extract those physiological uh, components because they may interfere or influence pain perception. I'm not a um, social worker or an anthropologist or an ethnographist, uh, someone that would spend hours in, uh, ex in describing uh, differences between spirituality and religion. That's, the, that's why I, I, I really like the, the word of oneness. Just simply believing that we are part of something bigger than mm -hmm. than uh, whatever the name uh, they can they can they can use. I really think this is a very nice definition of spirituality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, you already mentioned again the the, the, the point of my, my second question uh, that that you said this is something you don't talk about in in practice. But if body, mind, spirit is what we should be treating in our patients, how can we do that without talking about it? Uh, now, with, let's, let's make things simple. If we have a look at the model that was proposed by Deborah Smith, she was the first to introduce that into more a, a psychological side of uh, the meaning and purpose. So, just by asking, uh, why? Do you, simple questions. Why do you think? I was I was surprised the first time I, I was I was asking this type of question. Why do you think you you, you are you are in you are in pain, or what uh, events um, uh, happen at the time you started to have pain? What type of connections? So those are. It's more. Um, you have, you have different ways of, of talking about spirituality into Western um, therapy and content. The most common is the narrative way. So you never ask narrative, oh, I can say, you know, I had a patient, uh, he went to a retreat in, uh, in India, uh, practicing yoga and fasting for seven days, and then he came back, he, he never had, uh, he, he didn't have pain anymore. So, yes, oh, this may be, oh, I'm practicing yoga. Okay, that's a narrative. You, 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 you're talking to the patients, but we're using someone else. That's the most common. And this can be, this can be used. So, um, just for uh, what have you tried to reduce your pain? Yep. And some if, if if patients they say oh I've taken pills and and that's okay end of the but if at the end of the of the of the assessment but if they try to say you know um, I start to go to the church or uh, and so, so you can think what you can convert this type of information um, I think we you can start to convert information into meaningful. A way to evaluate their their belief system. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, I'm not going probably to ask what type of church is. It's what they find. What they find, mm -hmm. they will find connection with and support from people. Mm -hmm. And we 
that's, that is a good prognosis factor when people are supported with, in their environment compared to people who are alone and isolated. Mm -hmm. That's all. So it's more a narrative way of, uh, of um, assessing the, the, how the patient cope with, cope with, his, with his pain. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that directly. Um, do you mm -hmm. go to church? What are you doing to improve? And then I can let the patient. I, 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 the patient has the opportunity to uh, to express or not what is what he has done or not to to move. But it's more it's more giving opportunities to patient rather than being mm -hmm. just English. Do you do that? That that that. Yes. That? Thank you. I, I, like, I like your approach. I, li I, I like a lot what you just described. I think this is an area where, uh, that's very delicate. And uh, I think we should talk about it if we feel there is a need from the patient or if the patient uh, addresses that, that area. And I think we should have uh, we should have some ideas and we should have some things to offer in that in, in that way. But yeah. I but I agree with you that uh, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be telling all our patients that their solution is to pray to Jesus every day. This might not be their mindset. This might not be the right thing for them. No, I think it can change from the patients. Uh, we can we can specific events can occur in his life and he start to see things differently from one side to the to the to the other but this is type of question when i when for of, like i said it's not for routine mm -hmm. uh, for in, in routine care but when i have patients when the first time i take I, I take the case history and I say oh i had a cancer 10 years ago and now it's okay i i usually start to ask what type of coping strategies uh, he has. Mm -hmm. if, if they want to talk, they can talk. Yeah. If they don't want, they, they don't want. And and you, usually they they start to talk about this maybe at the second or third visit. Mm -hmm. Not usually not at the first time. But again, our approach is not is non judgmental. Mm -hmm. And we need to convert that yep. into a physiological process. Because if we do this type of uh, the, the, this type of interoceptive approach, it's likely that uh, this, those, this type of traumatic event, if they are not being uh, properly digested by, by the people, they may pop up. Okay? Mm -hmm. So are we, are we prepared as, am I prepared as an osteopath to deal with that, with someone crying? Oh, mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's, it's a way of uh, choosing carefully my techniques as well, yep. as, as well. Okay. Uh, if, if, if you start doing cranial and, and they, she, the, the patient starts to, and she, if, if the patients used to do uh, interoceptive uh, activity such as yoga or meditation, it can go very fast. And so probably they are not ready and, and probably this is not what they what they want. So so, so what so that that's why it it has really changed in the way of uh, of approaching patients. So, mm -hmm. so what what can I do for you? And why do you think you have uh, this pain? So you can see very uh, quickly at what level of interpretation the mm -hmm. patient gives to their pain. Is it just a body mind approach? Pain and movement. Mm -hmm. I pain when I rotate my, my my head to the left. I can then, or well, you know, um, uh, since I since I divorced uh, two years ago and I, I still have this pain. I've tried so many things. This may be related, and mm -hmm. so you can. It's it's part of patient education. Uh, I'm not telling uh, osteopaths that this has to be. It's, it's, it's part, the most important thing is it's part of the therapeutic alliance because mm -hmm. you can help patients to, to, to have meaning 
um, an understanding of what is occurring. And on patients start, oh, there's a, there's a, there might be a physiological process behind it. They say, oh, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not mad. Okay. A lot of people that have experienced nowadays experience, they say, you, you, I'm sure I like this type of patient. They say, I'm sure you'll, you'll think that I'm crazy, mm -hmm. but I, okay. So then I said, you know, I'm Peruvian. Uh, I have done so many crazy things uh, in my personal life. So it's, it's easier for me as well, you know, uh, to say, to, 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 to talk about my personal experience that I've been and, and that there's a scientific mm -hmm. uh, uh, framework for a secular use mm -hmm. of interpretation of those, those feelings. It's physiology. It's a physiological process. Mm -hmm. yeah. And since it's a physiological process, and we as osteopaths, we, um, we use uh, the, the physiology for our treatment, we should be aware of this to and become have a more holistic approach uh, for the people who request this specific approach, mm -hmm. not everybody. This was a good clue for the, the big question in, in this area of spirituality and consciousness. Uh, we talked about a, a lot about neuroscientists and what they find. And the common view of neuroscientists is actually that consciousness is a product of the brain. There are certain uh, electrical and, and chemical processes in the brain. And this is because we have these experiences. Uh, we have some activity in the temporal lobe, and this is when we experience contact with God. Or we have so, uh, something that changes in, an, in the frontal lobe, that uh, activity goes down, and then we feel more quiet. Uh, this is not exactly the spiritual view, and this is not what uh, natives would have thought. They would have thought of spirits and of consciousness as something independently of the body. So, what do you think? Does the brain produce consciousness, or is consciousness something else? Um, I don't know. I had, I had to set boundaries as well on my um, on the areas I, I wanted to investigate. I know there's a lot of science. Francesco will probably give you more information. Uh, on that, and was, I, I forgot the name. It's someone at the UCLA University is working on on, on this very specific topic. But since I'm I'm mainly a, a clinician, so I'm looking for information that can um, orient my practice mm -hmm. from the science and from the traditional healers. So I can't fully understand all that traditional healers and shaman are doing because I'm not mm -hmm. one of them. And I can cer certainly not understand the full value of you know, the neuroscience model because I'm not a neuroscientist. So when I have set boundaries is only have a look at studies where there's touch. Mm -hmm. because when there's touch, and, and specifically this interoceptive touch, so CT fibers, the insula, the, 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 the default mode net, there's, there's a scientific um, framework that can be, that could be used to develop knowledge, useful knowledge to improve patient care in osteopathy. Mm -hmm. You should invite Professor Anil said, he will give you a lot of information. There's a lot of things that, uh, that's, that's not even, that I would say that it's not even my personal interest. It's my, it's, I only have a professional interest in, in, in combining information from mm -hmm. scientific Western world and traditional, um, traditional healers. But I know that it's just a part of something, of something bigger. And the more you live, the more you experience, the more you discover, you discover things and, and the more we learn, we've just seen, we have a, we construct our mm -hmm. uh, reasoning based on our previous experience. The most important is just to uh, remain aware, like uh, 
Jean-Claude Van Damme would have, would have said. And this, if we are aware, we can, we can, we can uh, let uh, new information enter and build our, our vision in different, different ways. That's, and that was the purpose of the, of the editorial that uh, George Esteves published. Mm -hmm. it's, it's time to think uh, differently and use science because there's, there's science behind that. And I know that uh, he's leading a, a, a project um, where there will um, only neuroscience guy with Francesco and with uh, Hilary Abbey, I look from the video as well, because she did her... Um, she did a lot about mindfulness meditation. Yeah. That's re really Mindful interesting work. Mindfulness meditation. And so it's the same. It's a, 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 the same. My understanding is... Well, one meditative state, you're reducing the connectivity and then different type of manual approach that, that improve patient care. So I know they are uh, working on, an, on a new, new model for a more holistic approach of, um, of, of manual therapy in general and osteopathy in, in particular, because among the manual profession, you know, you have physiotherapy, you have chiropractors, they have different different models of, of it, ranging from, and they're more on the musculoskeletal side of, uh, which is, which is, okay. But today, the osteopathic profession still has this type of, of, of viewing the, the body, they still valuing this holistic approach. And this is, this may be quite unusual. So if we can provide, uh, if the researchers, George and his team can provide uh, a sound um, method, um, framework and, and based on neuroscience, to, that would be wonderful because for, we, we would be able to, to claim that osteopaths can really provide a more holistic treatment for people mm -hmm. who... We, 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 we asked for them. Thank you very much. It's so exciting. I have to I have to keep all my other comments and questions for next time. Probably, we could, I could we I I would be happy to go on for another hour talking about the, 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 the. As I told you before, this was the topic of my master thesis, where I think that certain techniques do induce altered states of consciousness in our patients, mildly altered states. So um, I, I think I'm going, going to sign up for your Embodies uh, group. To You're more than, than welcome. To, to see what, what we can do together yeah. here. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, Thank you for the and invitation. Again, I hope we'll have another occasion to, to continue this chat. Okay. Until then, I wish you a nice evening in Paris. And okay, thank you. Let, thank let, you let, let's, let's talk again soon. Bye. Bye. Für alle, die dabei geblieben sind, die uns heute zugehört haben, vielen Dank fürs Kommen, vielen Dank für den Besuch im Café Steelpoint. Es geht weiter nächste Woche Montag. Da haben wir auf dem Programm das Team des Osteopathischen Zentrums für Kinder. Zitronen auf Bananen sieht man nicht, ist der Titel. Das OZK war immer auch schon sehr künstlerisch orientiert. Da geht es nicht, nicht um Wissenschaft, wie jetzt gerade mit Raphael. Da geht es um persönliche Erfahrungen, um Geschichten aus inzwischen über 20 Jahren in der Arbeit mit Kindern, mit, ja, mit, über Geschichten mit dem gemeinsamen Spüren und mit dem gemeinsamen Lernen. Und wir werden nicht nur einen Gast haben, sondern wir werden acht oder neun Gäste haben. Der gesamte Vorstand des äh, OZK wird uns besuchen. Mittwoch wird es eine zweite Sendung geben. Da, gibt, da ist das Programm noch nicht ganz fix, aber wir werden auch Mittwoch senden. Wir hoffen, ihr habt wieder Zeit. Wir hoffen, ihr schaut euch wieder, schaut wieder rein. Bis dahin, liked uns. Bis dahin, sagt es weiter. Wenn euch die Sendung gefallen hat, sagt es zu euren Freunden, die sich das dann vielleicht nachträglich anschauen können. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen und schönen Abend noch, vielleicht in einem anderen Café oder in einem Gastgarten. Wir sehen uns nächsten Montag.